Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you very much for participating in today's HPTN 061 webinar. We want to thank everyone for joining us and we'd like to thank our co-sponsors NASM, NBGMAC, AVAC, and Beta Generation. My name is George Gates. I'm a Senior Program Officer here at FHI 360. The purpose of today's call is to share and discuss early results from the HPTN 061 study. Your moderators for today are Cornelius Baker, Project Director of the Be the Generation Bridge Project at FHI 360, and Christopher Chauncey Watson, Clinical Research Site Coordinator at George Washington University. I will hand it over to Cornelius, who will walk us through today's agenda. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us. Um, as George has already mentioned, and we value your interest and your time today. So um, we have a very exciting um, uh, app, uh, hour and a half ahead of us in talking about the results of the HPTN 061 study. And um, we're going to begin the, app, uh, the webinar with um, a presentation from the three um, principal investigators of the study, Dr. Bill Wheeler, Dr. Burrell Copeland, and Dr. Ken Mayer. And then we're going to have a set of presentations from um, people who worked on the ground in the study at the three sites and, and also from the chair of the HPTN 061 um, Black Caucus. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to then have those presentations, and then we're going to have two sets of question periods. Uh, the first set of questions will be those that you have emailed to us in advance that are asking for clarifying questions about the results of the study. So please, um, you know, uh, find your chat box that's located on your screen. And when you have a question that comes to you as the presentations are being made, please make sure to send those in. And we will, you know, we will ask the, um, the investigators as well as the peer health navigators and um, the chair of the Black Caucus those questions. And then we'll have an open dialogue with all of you um, with, and we'll open up the mic and we'll be able to um, ask questions of them as well. So let me just um, begin by introducing to you the, um, the, the pre principal investigators of the study. And we're going to begin with um, Dr. Ken Mayer who is the Medical Research Director of the Fenway Institute of, of Health, Fenway Health in Boston, and an Infectious Disease Attending and Director of HIV Prevention Research at Boston's Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Following Ken will be Dr. Burrell Copeland, who is an epidemiologist at the New York Blood Center and principal investigator of Project Achieve. Her research focus is to develop and test HIV prevention strategies and conduct studies of HIV epidemiology among gay men and women and men at risk through heterosexual contact. Our last um, principal investigator of the study who will uh, speak to you is Dr. Dale Wheeler, and he is a professor and dean at the Loyola University School of Social The conference Health. is now in listen only mode. In Chicago. So um, now we're, as, as, our, as our operator has just said, now we're going to listen to them. So um, I'll turn you now to Dr. Mayer. I'd like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation to share the early results of HP10061 with you today. On behalf of my protocol co-chairs, Dr. Beryl Koblen and Dr. Daryl Wheeler, and the HP10061 protocol team. Next slide. The purpose of HP10061 was to determine the feasibility and acceptability of a multi-component intervention for black men who have sex with men, including peer health system navigation, which will be described in more detail later in the webinar. Uh, next slide. The study was conducted in six cities in the U.S., Atlanta, Boston, Los Angeles, New York City, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C., and the men were enrolled uh, starting in July 2009, and enrollment continued till October 2010, and then the men were followed for, uh, subsequently for a year. 
Uh, to be in the study, men had to identify as black, be at least 18 years of age, and be a man um, or male at birth, so that transgender women were recruited in the study. Uh, their identity uh, could include uh, being black, African American, Caribbean, African or multi-ethnic black, and the men uh, to enroll in the study needed to report one episode of unprotected anal intercourse with a man in the past six months. The participants were offered incentives to refer up to five black sexual partners for participation in the study. Next slide. The study methods included collecting demographic information about the men and also behavioral assessments, and this used a CASI, which is Audio Computer uh, Assisted Self-Interview. The, the men also underwent a social and sexual network questionnaire, and this was completed with the assistance of an interviewer. At every study visit, the men were tested for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. They were offered risk reduction counseling, and they were offered the services of a peer community navigator, a peer health navigator, to link them to clinical and social services. So this was somebody who was from the community, uh, who was trained to be able to assist the men in making the appropriate linkages that they needed to stay uh, safe and to access health and other services. Uh, all individuals who tested positive for any infection were linked to treatment and medical care services. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the patient characteristics and the categories, uh, the majority of the men who came into the study uh, indicated that they either had a prior HIV negative test or um, did not know their test results. And these men then were tested for HIV and um, were then sorted into one of two categories. They were either found to be HIV uninfected when they enrolled or were newly diagnosed with HIV. We also enrolled men who had a prior HIV diagnosis uh, with a particular focus on men who were not engaged in care and or those who were having unprotected sex with partners who were uninfected or of unknown serostatus since the study was focusing on HIV transmission and prevention dynamics. In order to have additional data about uh, other HIV-infected men, we also enrolled up to 10 men per site who were known to be HIV-infected and were in care and were only uh, and or were only engaging in um, sex with HIV-infected partners. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the number of men who were enrolled in the study, uh, over 1,500 men, 1,553 men were enrolled. Uh, about 12%, 174 of the men, uh, had a prior HIV diagnosis. So of 1,379 men who did not have a prior HIV diagnosis, 46 refused testing and or had a baseline specimen that was not available for confirmatory testing at the HVTN network laboratory. 12.4% of the men were newly diagnosed with HIV, including three men who had acute HIV infection. More than 1,000 men were uninfected at baseline, and the vast majority were available for follow-up after one year. Next slide. Uh, about a third of the men were 30 years of age or younger. 46% had some college education or um, higher education. 31% um, worked full or part-time. But the men uh, were quite poor. 60% had an annual household income of less than $20,000. 2% of the... Uh, Individuals who uh, enrolled in the study were transgender, and only 30% of the men identified as gay or homosexual. Next slide. I'll now talk about some of the first findings about uh, comparing the men who were HIV infected and uninfected when they came into the study. Uh, next slide. Um, with a multivariable logistic regression analysis, after we looked at all the different factors of things that we were looking at in the study, we found that men who were newly diagnosed with HIV infection coming into the study were more likely to report unprotected receptive anal intercourse, and, and this is not a surprise. So this is an individual risk for HIV infection. Uh, the men tended to be older who were HIV infected uh, when they came into the study, and this is understandable because HIV is a chronic infection. So if individuals um, had longstanding asymptomatic infection they were unaware of, uh, uh, you'd see more of those infections in people who were older. Uh, we found two variables related to uh, socioeconomics that were um, highly associated with HIV infection, being unemployed and having a household annual income of um, uh, less than 10000 or even less than $50,000 for, 
was associated with being HIV infected. Um, we found, going in the opposite direction, that, that individuals who lacked stable housing were actually less likely to be HIV infected. But this may um, be uh, partially explained by the fact that, it, that this was a very small number of individuals. And the vast majority of uh, men in the study were poor but had some means of, of stable housing. That's what we've learned uh, from this particular study. In terms of the city of enrollment, compared to Boston, uh, men in Harlem, Washington, D.C., and Atlanta were much more likely to be uh, newly diagnosed with HIV infection. And uh, another factor that was highly associated with HIV infection was having one sexually transmitted disease or uh, at least um, more than one sexually transmitted disease uh, was even more highly associated with being HIV infected. So we conclude from these data that we saw very high rates of HIV and sexually transmitted infections among black men in the six city study. Uh, this is a major health disparity. We also found separate different kinds of factors were associated with HIV infection. Some were structural, such as poverty and unemployment. Some were behavioral, such as unprotected receptive anal intercourse. And some were biological. Um, this suggests the need for multi-component uh, programs. And these findings suggest that culturally tailored programs for black MSM are urgently needed to encourage repeated HIV and STI testing, engagement of care, and the use of antiviral medications for treatment or prevention while addressing social and environmental factors. Next slide. I'll now um, talk about a presentation uh, given by Dr. Sharon Manheimer of Harlem Hospital uh, looking at um, HIV testing patterns among the men in the study. Next slide, please. Non-adherence to HIV testing is defined by the CDC that individuals who uh, had either a negative HIV test in the past or were unknown status and engaged in risk-taking behavior but had not been tested in the past 12 months, this would be not adhering to the HIV-recommended guidelines. Late HIV diagnosis would be defined as individuals who were, once they were um, diagnosed with HIV, were found to have their first CD4 count less than 200 at the time of their HIV diagnosis. This would constitute an AIDS diagnosis. So in summary, uh, Dr. Mannheimer and colleagues found that non-adherence to testing guidelines was reported by almost a quarter of the men in the study. In other words, about 23% of the men had not been tested in the prior year despite reporting high-risk sexual behavior. And 14% of the men in the study I had never uh, been tested for HIV prior to entering into the study. The men who were less likely to adhere to testing guidelines tended to be older, unemployed, and did not see a medical provider. Almost all of the men did agree to get HIV testing through the course of the study, so this suggests that engagement in these kinds of studies can help in the uptake of HIV testing. Um, very concerning was the fact that almost one-fifth of the men, 19%, were newly diagnosed with HIV, uh, and when they were diagnosed with HIV, their CD4 count was less than 200, and these men tended to be older as well. These findings suggest um, a substantial need to think about ways to engage black MSM in more regular HIV uh, testing, uh, given the high burden of HIV infection in the population. I'll now turn the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Beryl Copeland. Thank you, and thank you for joining us today. We also have data on um, a little over 1,000 men who were HIV uninfected at baseline to be able to look at subgroups who um, may or may not be at higher risk of becoming HIV infected during the one-year follow-up. Um, of those 1,009 men who were HIV uninfected at baseline, uh, the median number of male partners was three, 47% uh, reported unprotected receptive anal intercourse. 76% reported unprotected insertive anal intercourse. About a quarter of the men had received money or goods in exchange for sex, and about 10% provided money or goods in exchange for sex. 38% had used stimulants, and 14% were diagnosed with a sexually transmitted infection at baseline. So among these 1,009 men, um, the HIV incidence or the number of infections that occurred um, per 100 men over the year was 2.8. Uh, so if you think of it as um, if 100 HIV uninfected men were 
uh, enrolled at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, um, uh, almost three of them would become HIV infected. We found significantly higher HIV incidence rates among um, the younger men aged 18 to 30 compared to the older men who were over the age of 30 with an HIV incidence of 5.9%. And those who reported unprotected receptive anal intercourse at baseline had a significantly higher annual HIV incidence rate of 4.9% compared to men who did not report unprotected receptive anal intercourse. We also found a higher incidence, although it wasn't statistically significant, among men who self-identified as either gay or hom homosexual, and the HIV incidence was 4.3%, and those with male partners only, compared to men who had male and female partners. And the HIV incidence among the men who had male partners only was 3.8%. We also found that men who had a uh, sexually transmitted infection diagnosed at baseline, their HIV incidence was 6% over the year compared to men who did not have a STI diagnosed at baseline. So these findings, um, as we've said in other uh, parts of this presentation, do not necessarily represent all black MSM in the United States. These are men that were enrolled in six cities. Um, additional analyses will be conducted to assess changes in behavior and uptake of peer health navigation during the study and the relationship of these factors with HIV incidence. And again, this really calls for the need for targeted and tailored and culturally appropriate combination HIV prevention strategies, both at the behavioral level, social, structural, and biomedical, which are urgently needed. And now I will turn the podium over to Dr. Wheeler. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're, you are. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to the oral presentations that Dr. Mayer spoke about and the rich data that Dr. Koblen just um, gave us, there were a number of posters presented at the International AIDS Conference. These posters were um, authored by members of the um, HPTN um, system, and many of them were authored by scholars within the HIV Prevention Trials Network. Dr. Leo Wilton um, led a, a, a sub-study on socioculture and psychological factors in HIV risk, and findings from this rich qualitative study point out and underscore that black MSM who reported unprotective um, receptive anal intercourse with last male partners were more likely to have lower internalized homophobia and to be HIV positive at enrollment um, compared to their peers. Black MSM who were HIV positive at enrollment were also likely to report unprotected insertive anal intercourse with last male partners relative to their peers. Dr. Russell Brewer, one of our HPTN scholars, did a study and presented on a history of incarceration among black MSM and correlates of incarceration, noting that within our sample, at least 60% of the um, respondents indicated that they'd had a history of incarceration. Dr. Timothy <coughs> Penniman, um, an, a scholar, did a study comparing men who have sex with men and men who have sex with men and women and noting differences and beginning with the fact that 47% of our sample also reported uh, having sex with women as well as men, and that of the men who have sex with men and women, there was more reported internalized homophobia, more substance use, more depressive symptoms, and less social support. Next slide, please. A poster by Dr. Tu um, highlighted sexual networks of black MSM and that black MSM were having... Um, more black partners, or having black partners was associated with being younger in age and also being HIV positive. Among HIV negative participants, serodiscordant unprotected anal sex was associated with, with non-overlap of social and sexual networks. Dr. Risha Irvin did a study on perceived discrimination and associations with healthcare utilization and HIV testing. Dr. Irvin is also one of our HPTN scholars. In her findings, she noted that the experiences of perceived health care discrimination was common with at least 19% of the sample reporting that, and that health care discrimination was positively associated with health care utilization and testing. Now, on this particular finding, it was, um, which is 
puzzled many of us, it, it's um, notable that we may be looking at a sample who, because they're engaged with health care, are more likely to report the um, negative discrimination because they have more opportunity to reflect on the actual experience. And we don't have a, 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 a sample that we can look at to say that, that this is generalizable to the larger population. But of the men who did report it, we're looking at greater discrimination for those who were engaged with the healthcare system. And Dr. Sheldon Fields, who will talk um, shortly um, about the Black Caucus in more detail, led a study looking at the lessons of implementing a Black Caucus within HPTN 061, noting that ours, HPTN 061, was the first study of its type to establish a Black Caucus and that the formation of the caucus closely mirrors the principles and concepts in community-based participatory research. Next slide, please. Our study is particularly thankful to each of the sites that participated, the clinical research sites and staff, the uh, protocol co-chairs, our funding partners at the National Institutes of Health, um, all of the HPTN staff <laughs> members, members from the Statistical Data Management Center, from the network labs at John Hopkins, from HPTN Core Operating Center, SHI 360, certainly the Black Race Research Group, and again, all members of 061 and the Black Caucus and our individual sites. The next two slides um, give you pictorial representations of the um, seven sites, so you can go to the next slide, please, where you see our community members and staffing from Fenway, Harlem Hospital, the New York Blood Center. Next slide. George Washington University, Emory University, San Francisco, and UCLA. Thank you very much, and I turn it back over to Cornelius Baker. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, we want to um, first just um, also give acknowledgement and a uh, deep level of appreciation to uh, Dr. Mayer, Dr. Copeland, and Dr. Wheeler for their leadership on the study. Um, we apologize for any technical difficulty in anyone hearing um, the presentations, uh, but these slides will be made available to you, and we'll give that information at the end of the next set of presentations. Um, but, um, you know, this has been a lot of information that has come to you, and, um, and of course, this study, um, which has already been mentioned as the largest cohort of black gay men, has yielded to us um, a wealth of rich data. So it's my um, privilege to turn it over now to Chauncey Watson, who will lead us through the next set of presentations. Thank you, Chris. So we've had an esteemed panel of individuals who went through sort of the process and where we are with respect to the early data that's been analyzed for HPTN 061. Now we actually want to take a look at how we actually went about recruiting these individuals, as well as some of the information that we can gather from the site perspective. So first we have Mr. Jamel Wallace. Jamel has been involved in HIV prevention for nearly 20 years and is passionate about black men's health. He's employed at Emory University and conducts behavioral health science research within the Rollins School of Public Health for the Brother Studies, as well as serves as a regional couple counseling and testing coordinator. Next, we will have Mr. Lewis Shacklefield, who serves as a peer health navigator at the Harlem site for HPTN 061, and also is a Columbia University student. Last, we would have Dr. Sheldon Field, who is currently the Assistant Dean of Clinical Affairs and Health Policy and Associate Professor of Nursing and the Interim Director, Doctorate of Nursing Practice Program in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences at Florida International University. His primary role in HPTN 061 was the Chair of the HPTN 061 Black Caucus. And first, we're going to turn it over to Mr. Jamel Wallace. Thank you, Chauncey. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, 061, HPT and 061, and how uh, we actually conducted this, the lessons we learned, and some of the barriers that we faced. Um, of all the six sites or cities that conducted the research, one barrier transcended nationally, and that was that no one retention or recruitment approach worked for getting black MSM enrolled into HPT and 061. 
And so sites individually drafted a treatment plan that worked, that could work um, in their particular communities where they lived and worked. Um, it was also observed that a multifaceted approach to re recruitment was necessary to enroll black men who have sex with men in the HPT and 061 cohort. And so as HPT and 061 is the name, so was the six sites that individually created their own names and identities and brands. Um, some of these uh, sites chose to identify the project as Project Achieve, Project SOS, 061, Unity, and the Brothers Project. Here at Emory, we simply called the study Brothers and had a logo made um, and put on t-shirts and bags that we wore out in the community. Um, so the study had presence and for people to be able to be comfortable with that. In addition to that, we also utilized other approaches to recruitment as well. And so 1-800 telephone number uh, was also established. And that was primarily established because some men were not comfortable in coming to the clinic. And so we wanted to make sure that folks were able to actually call in um, discreetly and be screened. Um, additionally, we also utilized social media and marketing, keeping in mind that uh, social technology is the way of the future. Uh, also, a component of the study was social networking, where uh, uh, men had the opportunity to enroll folks into the study. And so sometimes we would call on uh, other folks in the network to get the word out. Community identity and community ready is knowing that you know, we cannot, uh, as a community, do this alone. And so we need community partners to be advocates and allies. And so that was an approach that we use as well for recruitment. In terms of retention, uh, it goes on uh, that we, we utilize some of the same some of the same methods um, for this cohort and discuss further during this presentation, all sites uh, had difficulties initially to retain some of these men because of some social and structural constraints. Um, with that being said, sites had the flexibility and were asked to be innovative in their approach to retain black MSM um, in the face of adversity. And so some examples of that uh, were to go to some uh, shelters to be able to reach out to some folks who, who had issues uh, with housing, and then to also search online records, online search records for those who may have been incarcerated, and being able to be there for them when they got out. Um, one important part to the retention process and approach was that we built a culturally competent retention team to be able to go out into uh, the field to actually search for individuals that were lost to care. And so as a result of that, um, if you look at Emory's numbers, for instance, uh, Emory had a retention rate at six months of 32%. Um, at 12 months, uh, Emory had a 78% retention rate, which is an improvement of 46%. So it shows that the retention efforts um, went really, really well for this particular population. Uh, some other lessons that we learned was the fact that there's power in how we say and what we say. And so with most, if not all, research studies, it's necessary to have specific enrollment criteria. And so for the purpose of 061, uh, we sought to enroll a higher number of black MSM who are at high risk negatives and uh, HIV positive than not in care. And the preference behind that was to get black MSM into care. And so while the intentions were good, uh, we almost excluded all HIV-positive men in care. And so, again, while the intentions were good um, to cap this off at 10, we really lost a lot of folks that we could have included into the study. Um, also, if you can ponder this for a second, the effects of how screening questions are asked um, leads to perception and interpretation. So uh, ponder this. How many times have you had unprotected sex in the last six months versus have you had unprotected anal sex with a man in the past six months? And so when you look at these questions, it could be perceived as irresponsible if you ask the latter question. And we definitely learned the lesson that we did not want any of our men enrolled in the study to feel like they were irresponsible. Um, I want to turn it over actually now to Louis Shackelford, one of my colleagues, and he'll continue with this presentation. Thank you, Jamel. So first, I'm going to give a brief description of what Peer Health Navigation was in 061. 
So peer health navigators are individuals from the community who are trained in making referrals and using community resources to address practical needs. In 061, peer health navigators provided Black MSM with information, services, and support in an effort to help them lead healthier lives. In this manner, navigators can be a buddy, sounding board, health educator, facilitator to healthcare, guide, coach, advocate, or just a community resource. So in 061, working with a navigator was always voluntary. So preliminary expectations of peer health navigation goals differ significantly from participant-driven goals. Initially, it was theorized that HIV prevention services would be the most common needs of participants. However, participants reported needs that were centered on broader social issues, some of them being housing for HIV-negative individuals, employment opportunities, issues surrounding immigration status, and drug and alcohol abuse. Just to give you an example around, uh, in, around employment, I had a client who was seeking an employment opportunity but did not have the necessary state ID to get the job. The client also felt very uncomfortable going to get the ID considering the police presence in state buildings and his past run-ins with the law. To ease his mind, I escorted him to get the ID and guided him through the process. So unfortunately, the most common needs of our participants were sometimes the hardest to meet because we had very little to offer them in these areas. Added to that, the economic downturn made these needs even the more urgent. So at that point, keeping the participants motivated to pursue long-term long goals became the focus. But again, unfortunately, those who are most in crisis tend to be those who don't show up for their appointment, appointments the most. So doing this type of work, peer health navigators need a broad range of experience, of experience. And this can be achieved through having different backgrounds and different types of work experience. For example, here at the Harlem site, we had three uh, health navigators, one being an African immigrant who had years of peer experience in linking people to HIV care. We had another uh, navigator who did extensive work with community uh, youth out in Brooklyn. And then you have myself, who was born and raised in Harlem and did work here in the Harlem community. So this gave us different understandings of the community and different links to the community so we can come together and pool our resources. Uh, and I think this aspect of diversity is key for anyone working with Black MSM. So moving forward, we need to continue to support black MSM who are socially isolated, specifically those who are isolated due to stigma around, uh, around or associated with their sexual identity or sexual behavior. And we can start to do this by working to overcome homophobia within the community, pushing cultural awareness in the community, especially amongst providers, CBOs, and institutions. Identifying short-term achievable goals in addition to more ambitious long-term goals. Coach participants to stay focused on goals in the face of life's distractions and to work within the con uh, constraints of available resources. Lastly, future interventions may need to address the most pressing life concerns for the participant and then build HIV prevention and care programs around that foundation. So all that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Sheldon now to talk about the Black Caucus's involvement in the 061 study. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the call. I'm going to specifically talk about the lessons learned from trying to implement a Black Caucus into the research process of conducting this study. And I want to first start by saying that the Black, ca black Caucus was made up of mainly um, black self-identified MSM, some of whom were worked and participated at the research sites themselves, and others, such as myself, who were outside consultants that were brought in to the process. So there was a group of somewhere between 15 and 20 individuals 
who encompass the Black Caucus. And we were brought together to really look at the design, the implementation, how things were going to be analyzed, and how even continuing how the, um, the data is being interpreted with a focus on being racially and culturally appropriate and to make sure that the study was truly responsive to the needs of the black MSM. The main contributions fell into two areas, either cultural competence or, again, how, how the design and the implementation of the study was actually um, done. Um, next slide. One of the things, and uh, Mr. Wallace referred to it, was an issue that came up early with how do we retain the men in the study. So the Black Caucus was called upon to convene a working group, and we came up with, within a retreat, and we came up with a retention report that was released in uh, March of 2011 in which we really focused in on trying to assist the sites in the, um, the co-PIs with recommendations of how could we best retain the men in the study. And we came with three main areas. We had to mitigate the burden and the, the benefit of being in the study. So a lot of men in the study had transportation issues, couldn't get the site, sites were not as accessible, as, as we would have liked. There was issues about how long some of the research visits actually took. The ACASI, the computer assisted tool that was used um, while helped, was also an issue for some of the men. And then the issue of reimbursement, whether or not there was adequate reimbursement for the time involved in the study itself. And there was a range. Um, because the, the sites were spread across six cities, men were compensated on the low end about $50, on the high end about $100 um, for their visit. And, you know, that was based on the community uh, where the study was being conducted. The other recommendation that had to do with retention was around intervention deliver delivery. Whether or not there was culturally competent staff, um, black MSM representative staff that was actually conducting these follow-up visits was an issue at some of the sites. And while there was no breach of confidentiality in um, 061 um, that we are aware of, uh, some of the men um, felt that they had issues related to confidentiality or the idea that maybe their confidentiality was not going to be uh, maintained. And I think that has a lot to do with the historical, you know, representation of, of black men in research studies. Um, but it really was not found to be a problem in 061. It, it was um, just something that the men talked about. I, I, I referred to the staffing issue, whether or not there was appropriate black MSM staffing at the site. Um, how did they go about doing the, the recruitment itself? And this issue about contacts. And one of the things that, that happened was, you know, sometimes it's not just a primary uh, relative, it's a best friend, it's, it's a clergy member, it's, it's your family of choice that you choose to put down on a contact form. So we had to be flexible with these men about how we contacted them. And sometimes they were stably unhoused, and you would get contact information such as, well, you know, if you really want to find me, I'm usually at this street corner on Friday nights between 6 and 10, and, you know, that's how some of the men were found for follow-up. And community engagement, that locator form that we use is what I just was talking about and how, how did we be flexible in the information that we allowed the men to give us so that we could actually find them and retain them in a the study. Um, there needed to be dedicated retention staff. And not every site was, was mindful about that in the beginning. That recruitment and retention staff also had to be supported. 
and some sites did things like having uh, weekly staff meetings and um, allowing the staff to really uh, work through some of the issues that they were encountering during the study, and that was um, a good thing as well. And how do we communicate? Because some some men required just a little bit more follow up in between the study visits, and it didn't require much. Sometimes just a text message or a phone call would suffice, but. It, it said to the men that we cared about you more than just you being a research subject. So, next slide. So, what also were some other lessons learned? Well, we know that black MSM have a lot of competing life demands, and their, and their prioritizations are a little different. So, we, it really did need to be able to say to these men that your life mattered to us more than as research subjects. And that, I think, came across very clear when you look at the fact that those men in the study that had one peer health navigation visit were retained in the study at a rate of 100%. It only took one, extra, one, one visit to really help them connect to a study uh, in the way that we had not seen before. And when it comes to retention, it has to be proactive, not an afterthought. The benefits really need to outweigh the study burden. Some of those logistical issues, uh, the length of the interviews, the uh, clinic and lab hours, the transportation, and all the compensation has to be dealt with up front. There was a need for more council engagement between the study visits. Again, the example of the peer health navigation visits whereby um, we assisted the men with some of their other needs. There was an, ex an, ex an express need for more mental health support. And the degree to which racism and homophobia impacted the men in the study um, also needed to be a little bit more, more addressed. Uh, the sense of historical mistreatment and, and how very real that is for some of the men um, needed to be a little bit better expressed as well. Next slide. So I want to reiterate that this was really the first time a black caucus such as this was instituted in any type of, of, of HPTN study. And I think one of, the, one of the lessons we learned was that it was a phenomenal success. I think the establishment of the caucus really did improve the study and help to start shifting the scientific paradigm that is really restrictive in how we do these studies. Um, and that was really based on the community uh, participatory research step <laughs> in that, you know, the Black Caucus was of the community made up from individuals who identified in the community and, um, again, mainly black self-identified MSM themselves. Um, we functioned as a vehicle to really bring a voice to the study in a way that was really heard, respected, and, and understood. Um, our last overall recommendation is that this black caucus model should be duplicated across all of the days funded study networks that are trying to do uh, research with black MSM. Um, to that extent, I also want to say that the, the MTM, the microbicide network, um, has called together uh, a, a, a focus group. And we're going to work with them to try to do this as well. So some of this is being done. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Fields, as well as Mr. Lewis and Mr. Jamel. Next, we're going to have Dr. Daryl Wheeler, give us a summary over the information. We, we recognize that it was quite a bit, but we want you to have some take-home messages, so I'll turn this over to Dr. Wheeler. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, you've gotten a lot of information today. I hope that you found it useful, but I'd like to take a few moments to try and summarize some of the key findings here. 
first um, as has been iterated more than once. This was the largest prospective cohort study of HIV among black MSM in the United States to date. The study found high rates of undiagnosed STIs and new HIV infections, and the issues of poverty, unemployment, STIs, and risk behaviors each were associated with being HIV infected. Although other studies have looked at these issues, the size and the multi-center design of HPTN, being at six cities, being at uh, eight different unique venues and sites, allowed us to conduct analyses um, looking at becoming infected or staying uninfected in a very rich and unique way. The data suggests that effective interventions need to address social and structural factors, not just individual practices targeted, tailored, and culturally appropriate combinations of HIV prevention strategies are urgently needed in the epidemic um, raging for African-American MSM, black MSM. Next slide, please. Next steps for HPTN 061. Um, there are, we, we are very optimistic and working very hard to see that major papers come out, pa papers looking at the correlates of, of prevalent and incident HIV and STI, evaluation of the role of peer health navigation and HIV incidence, characteristics of newly diagnosed men. Those are going to be our, our first major um, themed papers. We have an, additionally more than 20 other analyses that are currently underway. These topics for the analyses and hopefully papers and presentations will include racism, medical mistrust, homophobia, incarceration, early life events, and HIV risk networks and community factors associated with HIV risk and infections. Next slide, please. And following up to the HPTN 061 study, there will be a new study, um, and it's at this point holding the number HPTN 073, which will be a pre-exposure prophylaxis study, a PrEP study, demonstration project, looking at black MSM and the utilization of C4, which is client-centered care coordination. In many ways, C4 is a, a ramped-up um, version of peer health navigation that allows very specific attention to the man's needs from a community perspective, a psychosocial perspective, and a biomedical perspective so that each of those areas are addressed as we introduce the concept of PrEP and um, follow men um, who would use PrEP and monitor their adherence and um, risk for adverse events and HIV incidents. There will be consideration of how to address structural aspects. Um, again, in HPTN 073, we want to build on the lessons learned and to make sure that we're incorporating these into future HIV prevention studies. And we're also, as I noted earlier with our scholars program, very happy um, to say that our scholars program will is going into its third year, and we've it brought on board at 13 um, young men and women um, in the, young in terms of their um, entry into HIV research, if not by age, who represent a diverse um, array of disciplines, medicine, behavioral and social science, public health, epidemiology, and so we're very excited to be continuing our scholars program. Next slide. And for more information, and we do want to remind everyone that this is being recorded, um, all presentations, posters, publications, press releases will be available at the Reddit website. Additional questions can be um, directed towards Erica Hamilton at FHI360, and we always like to thank FHI360 for handling so many of the administrative um, activities. And in your local areas, you'll also find here information for ways to um, reach out. In San Francisco, Unity Participant Forum will be um, presenting on Wednesday the 29th from 6 to 7.30, and you have the address there. Los Angeles, there will be a specific conference looking um, at some of these issues, and you 